Father. Good morning. I started to say, let me be the first here to tell you good morning, but I'm one of the few people that are here <laughs> in our worship center today on this snowy, uh, cold Sunday morning. You know, the Lord Jesus said, uh, where two or three gather together in his name, uh, there he is in the midst of them. Well, friend, we just barely make that cut off today. <laughs> I think we have we have three and a half people here. Can we <laughs> or three and a third <laughs> here? And it's good to be. Hey, there's some more folks coming in. Uh, and so we have five of us here this morning. I appreciate so much those who are faithful to come and make sure that our sound is working and that our lights are on and that our Facebook is up and running. And I welcome you to. Uh, this special time of worship, what a week we've had. I think my wife maybe summed it up best when she said this has been a weird week. It's been very strange. It's been very unusual for this part of the country. We always have people uh, that watch from uh, some from upstate New York. Uh, we've got some people in Minnesota that watch uh, faithfully. And so I know that you guys are laughing at us because we've had four inches of snow and it's literally crippled our town now for a week. How many of us last Sunday afternoon when we saw it snowing a little later in the afternoon could have thought that a week later uh, we would still have snow on the ground that... Uh, uh, church services would be canceled last Wednesday night and now again today only uh, through uh, Facebook are we able to share the gospel because of the roads. And so with all of that said, uh, it is good to worship. I pray that you and your family have been safe, you've been able to stay in, 
your groceries haven't run out yet <laughs> and that you have been able to weather the storm. We're blessed. Uh, this has been a blessed week because for the most part our utilities have uh, remained on. I think there have been some outages, uh, sporadic and sort of spotty. And even this morning I noticed that may have been the case. But for the most part, uh, this winter storm has been quite different than the one that we had last year that uh, saw power go off and be off for quite some time. So we rejoice in that and are grateful. I pray that you have God's word. You're going to open it. You're going to follow along with us as we worship together this morning. Uh, we had thought we might have a song, but we didn't. it didn't work out that way. Somebody suggested that I sing. And I see people are trying to avoid eye contact with me, those who are here. It was suggested that I sing, and then I pointed out to the person that suggested that, that Facebook does have uh, standards of decency. And so that I didn't want them to pull the plug on us this morning if I started singing. So we're going to focus on a real good place to focus today, and that is God's inerrant, infallible word. So I pray that you have your Bible, that you have it open, you're ready to follow along, study with us, share with us uh, as we proclaim the word of God this morning. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the privilege, the joy of standing before your people. And God, I'm grateful for that, uh, for that honor that you give me. I know that it's not deserved. Uh, Father God, that uh, you've used this, uh, the simplicity of preaching, Father God, and, and, I, and I pray that today that you would just use me uh, to speak a word to somebody, maybe somebody that's hurting, uh, Father God, maybe to a lost person, maybe to a Christian that has lost their way. Uh, Father, may you, as you promised, send your word out to accomplish the mission that you have for it to accomplish today. And Father, as you promised, that it does not return to you without caring forth your good will May that be the case this morning, Father God, we pray in the name of Jesus for his sake, amen. Take your Bible and open it to 2 Kings chapter 20, the 20th chapter of 2 Kings. Uh, we are away from our sermon series today. We'll start back next week. Uh, we'll be thinking about uh, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, the fruits that the Holy Spirit gives to us as believers. So as I said last week, your assignment again this Sunday uh, is to be reading Galatians chapter 5, uh, verses 22 and 23. Read the entire chapter of the book of Galatians, uh, of Galatians chapter 5, but uh, verses 22 and 23 contain that a list of some of the fruits of the Spirit that God gives us through the Holy Spirit. So we're thinking about the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And next Sunday we're going to come back to that theme and come back to that series. But this morning I want us to back up. You know, sometimes it's good to just back up and take a look at our lives where do we stand with the Lord? What, what is an inventory of, of my life? What does that look like to God? What does an inventory of your spiritual life look like uh, to God the Father? Back, way back in 1982, a long time ago, uh, I was called to serve a church in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, Oakville Memorial Baptist Church uh, called me to serve as their youth pastor. Uh, I was had graduated from college and was going to go to seminary and was waiting for my fiance to finish her college work. We were going to be married and then go to seminary. And during that time, I served Oakville Memorial Baptist Church on Knight Arnold Road in Memphis, Tennessee as their youth pastor. 
This was a church in Memphis that was similar to so many other churches in the sense that it was declining. It was in a part of Memphis that was transitioning. Most of the people that attended the church there didn't live anywhere near the church. They drove in from uh, someplace else, from Cordova or Germantown or Cairoville or East Memphis. And the church that had once been running 500 in Sunday school was now running about 200 in Sunday school. And that was typical, and it's unfortunately still typical, of what's happening uh, in so many of our inner cities. But we had a man in that church who was one of the sweetest, kindest men that I had ever met, that I've ever met. He always had a smile on his face, and I never heard him say uh, anything negative about an issue or about a person. Uh, he was one of those people, when you saw him, you thought, that man's been with the Lord. <laughs> uh, he's talked to the Lord today, and the Lord's spoken to him. And he was the discipleship training director. Remember discipleship training? <laughs> We came to church. We, church was an all-day Sunday event. We came on Sunday morning, and we had Sunday school and worship, went out to eat together, then came back later in the afternoon and had discipleship training and an evening service, and sometimes choir practice. But this man was the discipleship training director, and like all the numbers in the church, discipleship training was declining. And every Sunday, he would stand up on Sunday night and give the report from discipleship training how many we had in attendance. And it seemed like every week or month to month, the, the number was just sort of declining. And he would always smile from ear to ear, grin from ear to ear, and he would give that number and he would always say this, sometime you have to back up a little bit to move forward. <laughs> Sometimes you have to back up a little bit so that you can run and pick up speed and really move forward. That was his way of saying, don't be discouraged. Uh, don't let the number get you down. Uh, keep on keeping on and trust the Lord with the results. Well, on this snowy Sunday morning, uh, we want to think about a king that had an opportunity to stop and take inventory of his life. Hezekiah was a good king. He was a godly king. And Isaiah the prophet came to him and said to him, uh, you're going to die. He was sick. And he was sick to the point of death. And Isaiah said, God has told me the word of God is, you're going to die. You're not going to survive. And so you need to get your house in order. You need to get your your, your life where you want it to be when you close your eyes in death. Uh, can you imagine what would you do today uh, if you knew, okay, beyond a shadow of a doubt, God has told me this is when I'm going to die. Uh, I, I, I have time to make peace with him and with people. Uh, most of the time when we think about getting your house in order, we think about a will or we think about... Uh, putting our finances in order or, or working things in a way that our children and maybe now our grandchildren are taken care of. Uh, but that's not what is important in the scheme of eternity. And so I want you to follow along in your text in, in 2 Kings chapter 20. Uh, what happens to this king and uh, this account, how he was able to back up and take a look at his life before God allowed him to move forward. In 2 Kings chapter 20 and verse 1, In those days Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amoz, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order because you're going to die. You will not recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devo devotion 
and have done what is good in your eyes? And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Before Isaiah had left the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him, Go back. Go back and tell Hezekiah, the ruler of my people, this is what the Lord, the God of your father, says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. On the third day from now, you will go up to the temple of the Lord. So he said, in three days, you're going to be well enough. You're going to go to church. You're going to go to the temple of the Lord. Verse 6, I will add 15 years to your life, and I will deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city for my sake and for the sake of my servant, David. A chance to back up and look at one's life, uh, to take that inventory uh, before, before the Lord. What did Hezekiah do? What happened in this narrative? I don't know that we could say it changed the mind of God, although the Bible tells us there were times when God, it said he relented and he changed his mind and he came back. Uh, to a, a place uh, that he had uh, steered away from. He didn't get away from his will. Uh, but what happened here? Uh, how do you get your act together in the eyes of God? Well, first of all, Hezekiah was honest with God. And we need to be honest with God. We need to know how important it is to stand before the Lord and to... Be honest with him. Now, Hezekiah was one of the few bright spots uh, in the Davidic uh, line of kings there in Judah. Uh, he was a good king. His dad was Ahaz. He was a very wicked man. He didn't trust the Lord. When his kingdom was threatened, uh, his dad, his father Ahaz, rushed to make an alliance with the people of Assyria, and that weakened the kingdom. And Hezekiah became king when he was 25 years old. And he brought about reform. He brought about a spiritual reform in the land. Uh, he removed the pagan idols from uh, the temple of the Lord. And he uh, once again used the temple for worship. I hope that you kept your Bible open because we're going to look at a verse or two that uh, we didn't look at in our main text. Uh, look there, if you would, in 2 Kings chapter 19 in verse 14. Here's what's happening. The king of Assyria has sent a letter to Hezekiah saying, I'm going to get you. I'm going to, I'm going to get the kingdom. I'm going to attack Judah and I'm going to destroy it. And Hezekiah did something. He brought that letter to the temple and spread that letter out before the Lord and, and shared what that letter said. In verse 14 of 2 Kings 19, the Bible says, Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, Lord, the God of Israel, and thrown between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to the words Sennacherib, that's the pagan king, has sent to ridicule the living God. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrians' kings have laid waste these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. So the Assyrians, when they captured the land, they destroyed the uh, idols there, but they were not godly people. And then in verse 19, Now, Lord our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. And so... Uh, here was a good king. Instead of turning to a pagan uh, for an alliance, he turned to the Lord. He relied on the Lord. 
And here back in our text over in chapter 20, here's this good king and he's sick to the point of death. And the prophet comes to him and it's not the kind of message that you might want to hear when you're sick and on uh, your sick bed. And that was that uh, he, his life was not going to last. He, he was going to die. And he opened up his heart before the Lord. And even though he was a good king, he wasn't perfect because the Bible tells us, uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That included Hezekiah. And the first thing that he did, notice what he did back over in 2 Kings chapter 20 in verse 2. And again, keep your Bible open. We're going to another verse here in a moment. Now notice in verse 2 it said, says, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Uh, he, he turned his face to the wall. What does that mean? That means he got rid of all the distractions. He didn't look to his advisors. He didn't look to a counselor, uh, maybe that wasn't a godly counselor. He turned his face to the wall where he couldn't see anybody or maybe hear anybody. It was just him and the Lord. How many of you sometimes think, I need to turn off my phone? I need to turn off my computer. Uh, I need to turn off the television. Uh, my wife is watching this and she's saying, you need to turn off your phone. She tells me that sometime. Uh, there'll be something on television and I'm not even, I can't even pay attention to the television because I'm watching uh, what's on my phone or, or responding to emails or whatever the case might be or text. And he focused on the Lord and he was honest with the Lord. And friends, I, I cannot stress enough how important it is to be honest with the Lord because he knows the truth ahead of time. One of the stories that I, I like to go to very often at this point is over in the New Testament in Acts chapter 5. Remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira? Remember what happened there? People were selling property and they were bringing the proceeds of the sale and donating it to the church, giving it to the church. And Ananias and Sapphira had some land and they sold it but they held part of the proceeds of the sale back. And when they brought the money to give to Peter and the disciples to enter in, be entered into the church treasury, remember what happened? They said, this is all the money. They had some, they were holding it back, which that was fine in and of itself. That was fine. Uh, the same way when, you know, if you were to, make a donation of the church. You say, I sold something, whatever, a value, and I would like to give half of it to the church. I'd like to give this proportion to the church. I'm going to keep the rest, and, and that's all good. And that's fine. They lied. They lied, and the Bible says that uh, they were even asked, you know, was this the um, a price of the sale? And Sapphira first said, yes, this is all the money uh, from the cell, Peter asked uh, Sapphira that. And uh, because they lied, the scripture said they lied to the Holy Spirit. They weren't just lying to Peter and the disciples. They were lying to the Holy Spirit. And remember, they both died one at a time when they came in and lied about that offering one by one. This couple died, and they were taken out and buried. And so to me, that's such a good warning about being honest with God. So this morning, as we think about backing up to take a look at our life, think about how important it is to be honest with God. God, here's my life today. He knows what it is already, but he wants us to confess our sins. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, and that always spoke to me when it said there in 2 Kings 20 verse 2, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and he prayed to the Lord. When I was in seminary, 
in Fort Worth, Texas, Southwestern Seminary. I had some very godly uh, professors. Uh, and I uh, look back now and I wish I had listened more and <laughs> taken better notes and uh, tried to glean more from them, especially the ones who had been in ministry and had uh, walked with the Lord for decades. One professor in, in particular was telling about when he was a young man. He wasn't a young man when I was in seminary. Uh, he's, I'm sure, and I know, long since been with the Lord. But he told about getting very, very sick. And he said, I was very ill and I was in the hospital. And he said, my wife couldn't stay with me all the time. She came. But he said, I was in the hospital. And he said, I wasn't there for days. Uh, I wasn't there for weeks. He said, I spent several months in the hospital. And that was his testimony. He said, you know, when you are, you're laying there and you're flat of your back in the hospital and you're staring up at the ceiling day after day after day, you really begin to talk to the Lord. And you really begin to be honest with the Lord. And he shared that testimony about how God eventually not only healed him physically but he healed him spiritually because he gave his heart and his life totally to the lordship of christ he was already a christian but he needed to turn over some things in his life to the lord and he did just that and friend you need to be honest with the lord you know it's it's possible to lie to other people about our relationship with him well doesn't this person go to church all the time I've heard this person pray, well, I, I've sat in their Sunday school class, or I've heard them sing in the choir, or I've heard them do all of these things, watched them, seen them, witnessed them doing these things. But that sometimes in our hearts, we're not right with him. So if you could back up this morning and take a look at your life, what does it look like to God? There's so many uh, innovations I read a man that had a, his wife wanted to remodel their bathroom and so she got all the latest and greatest that they had and they had a mirror that had uh, a, a big mirror in their bathroom that had the light built into the mirror and it was motion activated. So every time when you walked into the bathroom you didn't have to hit the light switch, the mirror uh, over the vanity over the sink came on. And the man said, I hate that mirror because every time, I go in the bath, every time I go in the bathroom, I see myself. <laughs> he said, I walk past that mirror and there's my image. And he said, I don't like to see it. And it reminds me about how I'm getting older. And friends, let me encourage you to walk by that spiritual mirror and see what God sees in your life today. This man got honest with God and then he took practical steps to repent. Repentance is not just feeling sorry for your sins. We've said that many, many times. Repentance is doing something about those feelings of guilt and sorrow, acting upon them. God told Hezekiah uh, to put your life in order. Uh, there in verse 1, this is what the Lord says. Put your house in order because you're going to die. You will not recover. That meant that even though this was a good king, even though that he had been faithful, he was going to die. Sometimes the most faithful people you'll ever meet die a young age, at a young age. Why does it happen? I can't answer that. Sometimes you see the sorriest, most low-down person you'll ever see live to be 80, 90, or 100 years old. Why? I can't answer that. Maybe God's giving that person more and more time to get right before he faces eternity. But being honest with the Lord and doing, not just, not just being honest with him, say, God, here's a problem. But God says, what are you going to do to take care of that problem? If you have your Bible close by, and I pray that you kept it open, uh, look over in Luke chapter 
19. Luke chapter 19. In Luke 19, uh, the story that uh, we all love from the time we were children, uh, the story of Zacchaeus. Remember that st story of Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was a little, old ma uh, a little old man and a little short man was he or however it goes. <laughs> he was short. My kind of person <laughs> because I'm not very tall. And the Bible says that one day Jesus was coming by and Zacchaeus went and climbed up in a sycamore tree so he could see him because he was short. He couldn't see over the crowd. And Jesus looked at him, and you remember what happened. Jesus said, come down, Zacchaeus, and he did. And Jesus went home with him, went into his home, and Zacchaeus got right with the Lord. But in Luke chapter 19 in verse 8, that's not all that happened. In order to get right with God, in verse 8, the Bible says, But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Wow, what this man was who had been a tax collector and who had... Uh, robbed people of their money and taken more in taxes than he should have taken just for his own uh, ill-gotten gain, was saying, I'm going to give half of everything I have away, and if I've cheated anybody, I'm going to repay that four times. That probably meant he bankrupted himself. He was bankrupt physically, but spiritually he reaped a great reward and great riches. Because he said, here's what I need to do to get right with the Lord. Sometimes people say, I know my life is not right with the Lord. And the Lord says, okay, it's very simple. Here's what you need to do to get right with me. And people say, well, I'm not willing to do that because that's difficult. What, what is God telling you to do today? What did Hezekiah do? Well, he prayed, didn't he? And not just a... Prayer over a meal, which God wants you to do, by the way. Pray when you go out to eat. Sometimes people say, well, you know, it's a little awkward, whatever. It shouldn't be. Uh, pray when you go out to eat. Pray with your children when you put them to bed at night. Uh, be a prayer warrior. But Hezekiah prayed. He went before the Lord in prayer. And also he showed contrition. He was contrite. Uh, he turned his face to the wall. That was an act of grief and sorrow. He turned, he didn't want to have anything to do with anybody because uh, he felt grief and remorse. Uh, have you ever known somebody that said they were sorry, but you could tell they really didn't mean it? Have you ever had somebody ask you for forgiveness but they really didn't you could tell they didn't really care whether you gave them forgiveness or not ever known somebody like ever had that happen when I was working for my dad at his uh, tractor uh, place in Chipolo when I was growing up my father owned a farm equipment dealership uh, there in Chipolo and we had this old boy that worked for us uh, he was not the smartest person you're ever going to run into. I'm not either, and uh, most of us aren't anywhere near as smart as we think we are, but he was maybe lacking a little more than others. And one day, he, my father got in a new alternator to go on a case tractor. This is how old this story is. That was before Case and International merged together. And so he was the case dealership there in Chipolo for many years. And, and my dad said to this old boy, he said, I want you to take this alternator, take this generator and look at it. It's going to sit on the, sits on the side of that motor, that engine of that tractor. And you have to push, push this in there and the gears have to line up with this uh, where it's going to line up with the uh, gears in this tractor the starter, I think it was a starter maybe. And it also, it had a flywheel on it that was made out of plastic. So he said, when you, when you set this in place, 
Watch this, he said. You can't hit that plastic flywheel where the belt goes around it that turns it. You can't hit that with a hammer to tap that, force it up in there. He said, get a block. Men, you know what I'm talking about. Get a block, whatever. Uh, he said, try to line that up. And the guy said, yo, I've got it. And he left with it and went back in the shop. Well, it wasn't just a few minutes later. He came back up with that alternator, generator, starter, whatever it was. I can't remember, but the flywheel was broken. <laughs> because when he tried to affix that into the engine and into that uh, the motor of that, and the gears didn't line up, he took a hammer, a mallet, and hit the flywheel, and he broke it. And that it just had to be replaced, the whole thing. Uh, you couldn't replace just that one piece. And he walked up to my dad and handed it to him. This was expensive even back in the day. And he said, whoops. He said, I'm sorry. And turned around walked off. And my dad said, well, try not to let it get you down. <laughs> uh, uh, try not to lose too much sleep over it. I can see how devastated you are by what you've done. He wasn't sorry. And there are a lot of people that say, Lord, I'm sorry, and I need your forgiveness. And God says, okay, I'm, I'm going to forgive, and I'm ready and willing to forgive you. Here are the practical steps that you need to take in your life to make your situation right with me. And people say, I'm not that sorry. Most importantly, Hezekiah searched his heart and life for that which was not pleasing to God. Uh, again, Hezekiah there in verse 3, he said, Remember, Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and, and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Maybe he wept because when he thought about how good he was, he realized he wasn't that good. Uh, the scholars here believe that Hezekiah, by the way, was not heartbroken because he was going to die. Hezekiah was not afraid to die. Hezekiah was heartbroken because he knew Israel needed his leadership. Hezekiah was heartbroken because he didn't want the Davidic bloodline. These were all descendants of David who were king, and they didn't, he didn't want that to end with his death. And, and so it wasn't a remorse maybe for the end of his life, but for the end of his life leadership over God's people. And Hezekiah wept. Hezekiah cried, but notice when he cried. Everybody's still with me? Everybody's still? If you were here, I would be walking from side to side <laughs> trying to keep your attention, but still with me. Hezekiah wept. He cried. And notice when he cried. He cried after he confessed to the Lord his life after he was honest with the Lord. And uh, this was the last of the actions that are mentioned before Isaiah left. Uh, these weren't crocodile tears. You know what a crocodile tear is? It's one that's not real. And it is always amazing to me how these actors can act in these sad movies or sad TV shows or a sad play or uh, a sad Broadway production of some kind. They can cry, and then it's all an act. They can cry, and they can make you cry. <laughs> and theirs is just all an act. Maybe you remember, I remember many years ago, there was a television preacher that unfortunately, like so many in his day, became involved in a scandal. And he was going to stand up one Sunday morning in his mega church and he was going to ask the Lord to forgive him and ask the people of the church to forgive him. And maybe you remember the image, I'm not going to call the name or whatever. Uh, of him looking up and he was just tears flowing down his eyes and he was looking up, toying down his face, coming out of his eye. And he's looking up and he's, he's just crying his eyes out. And remember it wasn't about within a few weeks after that, he kind of reneged. He said, I'm going to resign and move on and whatever. And then he said, no, I'm not. 
And so all those tears meant nothing to the Lord because they weren't sincere. Hezekiah's tears touched God's heart. Let me tell you, God, when you cry in grief, it touches the heart of God. When you are hurting, God understands. Uh, God's son went through everything that we are going through and go through in life, yet he was without sin. That's what the Bible says. And so know that those tears and that hurting that you have don't go on unnoticed by the Lord. And let me close with this. Hezekiah accepted God's word, and he received God's revelation. Uh, again, in verse 1 of uh, 2 Kings 20, the Bible says that Isaiah said, this is what the Lord says. Uh, this is what the Lord says to you. And then he tells him, uh, then in verses 4 through 6, uh, I, before Isaiah left the middle court, he hadn't gotten very far. God said, turn around and go back. And he accepted that message from God. And Hezekiah accepted that message from God. Sometimes people say, I wish the preacher would say something to help me in my life. I wish the, the lessons we have in small group, I wish they were more for me. They're not for me. They're for somebody else. I don't need to repent because I've already done that. Uh, years ago, I prayed and asked Christ into my heart and my life, and that's good. But let me tell you what, folks, sometimes as a Christian, things creep into our life, and you need to back up today and look at your life and accept the word from God. Every message that I preach is always something that I've worked through the week before myself or God's dealt with me on that very thing. Uh, God heard the prayer of Hezekiah and he saw the tears. He was moved and he acted and he spoke. And Hezekiah, Isaiah accepted it. Hezekiah, or there in verse 4, when God told Hezekiah in verse 5, or Isaiah, excuse me, the prophet, go back. He didn't say, I'm not going to go back in there. I've, I've already bothered the king once. I don't want to go back again because I've just devastated him with this news that he was going to die. And God said, go back. And he went back. And God told Hezekiah uh, what he was going to do. He said, you're going to get better. I'm going to deliver you from the hand of the Assyrians. And Hezekiah accepted that. And he received God's blessings. There's an old account, an old story about a beggar who had been on the streets begging back way, way back in the day. And in the day, grain and corn was just a base a sustenance for people to have to eat. And so people had given him some handfuls of corn, kernels of corn, because that's all they had in this little village. And one day this beggar had been out begging and he had his pockets just packed full of corn. He was going to eat and be able to have something to eat that day and that night because people were handing him these handfuls of kernel corn. And he had his pocket loaded with corn. And unbeknown to him, the people in the village, their announcement rang out, the king was coming, and he was just about to come into the town. And to this beggar, he was amazed, and he looked up and saw the king of his country uh, coming through this town. And the beggar was able to get close enough to the king, and he said, I, I need and I want and can you give me something to help me in my life? And the king looked at the beggar and said, I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal with you. You give me something first. And the beggar was kind of taken back by it. And so he reached into his pocket and pulled out a handful of those kernels of corn. That's all he had in the world. And he took one, and he handed that kernel of corn to the king. The king cook, took that kernel of corn, 
and reached in and pulled out a handful of gold nuggets, a whole handful of them. And he picked up one and handed it back to that beggar. And the moral is, for the rest of his life, that beggar lamented the fact that he did not empty his pockets for the king <laughs> and give him all the corn that he had instead of just giving him one and getting one nugget of gold. And I think so oftentimes we say to the Lord God, Lord, here's one piece of my life. God here is not much, but it's something. And we give God a fraction of our commitment. And God in turn gives us a fraction of the blessing that he wants to give to us. What about you today? Maybe from right where you are, maybe you are hundreds of miles away, maybe you're right down the street from this church building. I know many of you that's the case this morning as we're not here in person. Is Jesus Lord of your life? You, did you know you can pray right now right where you are and ask Christ to come into your heart and your life? You don't have to be in the church. You can, right from where you are, pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart and life. You can recommit your life to Jesus right where you are right now and, and recommit your life to him. As God speaks to your heart this morning, even though we're not together in this place, I would be in trouble with the Lord if I did not give you an invitation and offer an invitation to you to come to know Jesus. And so this is your opportunity we don't know like Hezekiah. Hezekiah knew God said, you're, you know, you're not going to live. We don't know. Could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be next week, next year, next decade, next minute. As you back up this morning, if God looks at you and says, get your life in order, what do you need to do to accomplish that? Father God, we thank you so much for your love. God, thank you for seeing us through the winter storm. And Father God, for seeing us through all the storms in life. Thank you, Father God, for your goodness, your mercy, and your love. And Lord, I pray now for everyone that's watching. God, I pray that you bless each household, uh, all those that are watching, Father. And I pray Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus, for all those who are watching who might be lost without Jesus, they've never prayed and asked Jesus into their heart. Father, as you speak to them, I pray that today would be the day when they would get their house in order. Father, I pray for maybe Christians that are listening. Maybe, maybe there's one, maybe there's dozens uh, of Christians that would say, here's something in my life as I back up and look at my life. Here's something in my life that I need to turn over to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm walking in the fullness of his love, but not the complete fullness of it because there's sin in my life. I've only given God a fraction of my life. Maybe that's you, and today you need to say, God, here is Here's all my life. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. If God speaks to you, as God speaks to you, Lord, I pray for those to whom you're speaking that they would get their house in order today. Thank you, Father God, for your love. We praise you in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. May God bless you and may you have a wonderful week this week. Lord willing, we'll be back on Wednesday night, and then again next Sunday, everything's going to be back on. Uh, again, Lord willing, you stay safe. God bless you this week. Go out and tell somebody about Jesus.